So here I have drawn a pretty basic model of the atom, and I've drawn three different shells on this atom. We have the n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3 shells, and n is our principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number is basically going to explain the energy level that you are present at within the atom. So n ranges all the way from 1 to infinity, theoretically. And so this is going to represent our energy level. Now within this shell, let's say that we can draw our shell like this big box over here. This is our shell. And let's say that we're looking at the n equals 2 um, energy level. So within this energy level, we're going to have something that we can represent with the second quantum number, or the azimuthal quantum number, which is represented by L. Now L ranges in values from 0 to n minus 1, and L is going to tell us the shape of the orbital. And this is what we call the subshell. And it'll make sense in a moment because it is present within the shell. So the values of L, we can actually make a little table here. We can say, well, the numerical value of L can be 0, 1, 2, 3. And the letter values, well, 0 is going to correspond to an S orbital. 1 is going to correspond to a P orbital. 2 is going to correspond to a D orbital and 3 is going to correspond to an f orbital. So if we look at our n equals 2 um, energy level, or n equals 2 shell, we can say, well, since n equals 2 here, and l ranges from 0 to n minus 1, then we know that our l values are going to be 0 and 1, which means that we're going to have an s orbital, and we're going to have a p orbital. So we know we're going to have an s orbital, and we know we're going to have a p orbital within this n equals 2 um, shell. So then we can go further than that, and we can say, well, what exactly do these orbitals look like? And this is what we're going to find out from the third quantum number, which we represent using ml. And we call this the magnetic quantum number. Now ml ranges from negative l all the way to positive l. So we know that our L value for an S orbital, let's say this, this, is our, this is our S orbital, and this is our P orbital. So we know that the L value for the S orbital is going to be 0. So our range of ML values, are, it's just going to be 0. And since there's only one number that we could possibly have for ML, we know that there's only one possible configuration for this orbital in three-dimensional space. And this is basically what our s orbital is going to look like. And this right here is the only possibility for our s orbital. It's only going to look like that. Now the p orbital, it's a little bit more complicated. So the p orbital that we have right here, we can say, well, ml, since our p orbital has a l value of 1, as we see here, we can say, well, ml is going to range from negative 1 all the way to positive 1. And this leaves us with 3 values for ml, negative 1, 0, and positive 1. And this means that there are three possible configurations for this p orbital in three-dimensional space. Now what are those going to look like? Well, if I draw sort of a set of axes here, and I'm going to draw three of these for each configuration, 1, 2, and 3. Oh, that's kind of bad. Um, and let's say that this is our z-axis, and this is going to be our y-axis, and this is going to be our x-axis. So there's three different configurations for a p orbital that can exist. The first configuration, we might call this one pz, and this one's going to look like this. And the second configuration, we might call this one px, and it's going to look like this. And the last configuration, we might call this one py and it is going to look like this. And these are our three possible configurations. This is one, this is two, and this is three for the p orbital in three-dimensional space. So at any given time, all three of these exist in this p orbital, uh, in this p subshell, sorry. All three of these p orbitals exist in this p subshell. Um, they just might not all be occupied. And so these three 
orbitals are what we get from the ml value. And this as well, we get from the ml value. And again, ml just tells us what the orbital looks like in three-dimensional space. And finally, we have the fourth quantum number, which some might refer to as the spin quantum number. And this is represented often by ms. Now the spin quantum number basically tells you the direction of the electron spin um, within the orbital. So each orbital, it can hold two electrons. And the value for ms can either be positive one half or it can be negative one half. It can't be any other values, there's no range. It's either positive one half or negative one half. Now, if ms is positive one half, then we might have an electron like this. This is our electron right here. I'll just draw a negative charge. And it might be spinning in this direction. And we have a south pole here and a north pole here. And so our magnetic field lines are going to run like this. They're going to go upward. And so the positive one-half value is assigned a directionality of up. And the opposite is true for negative one-half. So we have our electron right here. And if ms is negative one-half, well, then we're actually going to be spinning the other way, like this. And our magnetic field lines are going to go. This is, they should not overlap like that, but we can pretend I'm a better artist. Um, <laughs> The magnetic field lines are going to go down. We have a north pole up here and a south pole down here. And so it's the opposite. The negative one half value is assigned a directionality of downward. And so again, just to drive this point home about how you should visualize this, we can pretend our energy level represented by N or our shell is this big box. And then within that shell, we can say, well, inside this shell, we have subshells. They exist within the shell. They're a substituent of the shell. So we have subshells, and these can be S, P, D, or F. And this is what we get from our second quantum number. And then within those subshells, we have orbitals. And orbitals, well, they just tell you how this is configured in three-dimensional space. And this is what we get from the ML value, from our third quantum number. And this tells you the possible orientations of this orbital in three-dimensional space. And remember, all of these orientations exist at any given time. It just might be that not all of them are fully occupied or occupied at all. And then within, within these orbitals, we actually have electrons. And each one can hold two electrons. And these electrons have a quote-unquote spin that we assign a value of positive or negative one-half. And this is what we get from our fourth quantum number. And it's going to tell you um, sort of the direction of the electron spin. So hopefully that helps you visualize the four quantum numbers in an atom.